Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, it's my delight tonight to be able to talk to you about lessons from renewable energy laws, um, which is a project that I have been undertaking for about the last 10 years, looking at every country in the world that has national renewable energy law and trying to better understand how countries actually legislate to support their domestic consumers and the domestic renewable energy producers and how that might contrast with other views around uh, the internationalisation and regionalisation of renewable energy law. So today what we're going to cover is we're going to talk about this new original research. I'll briefly outline the current state of play and then I'll talk to you about where I think renewable energy law and also the law for new emerging energy technologies is going to go into the future. So I just quite like this photo. This photo is from the Philippines and it was at a community event advocating for a renewable energy act or bill at the time. And it was one of the earlier um, pieces of legislation within Asia um, that has been very widely accepted. So the whole premise behind this research was I was trying to understand why as um, renewable energy sources um, became um, much more um, accepted around the world, as the technology and the manufacturing became much more commercialised and particularly concentrated in countries such as China and South Korea and Japan, as well as obviously um, Germany, Denmark and the United States. States, whether um, countries' renewable energy laws would also come under pressure to harmonise, to facilitate trade, improve information sharing and ease administration. So this whole research was really founded on the idea that I expected to find that as the technologies became um, much more similar globally, we would also expect to see the laws becoming more similar. But here's a spoiler alert on today's session. Except in the European Union, what my research has actually found is that stark differences have actually emerged in many areas of renewable energy law. And that actually this divergence acts as a source of competition, both in terms of technology manufacturing, but also as a source of investment. And I think the reason why this has occurred is because this is a very large market globally. So um, in 2018, renewable energy accounted for 63% of net additions to global power generation. And the market um, in this um, new um, renewable generation is worth US $289 billion. Um, Noting, of course, that that figure does include hydropower. But the statistic that I've always found to be particularly striking is this idea that over the past five years or even longer now, renewables has attracted more than double the annual investment into new fossil fuel generation capacity. So we've really seen a marked shift in this energy transition towards renewable energy. And one of the things that has been facilitating that shift has been the use of national renewable energy laws. So for my sins, uh, for the past 10 years, one of the things that I have been doing is I have been collecting every country in the world's national renewable energy law. And that involves um, doing searches on legislative databases, trying to track down government ministers. Um, I've been known to tweet it out. Uh, if anyone is on the line from Togo, Togo caused me particular problems when they introduced their new law in uh, July 2018. So the last time I took a snapshot, I like to take snapshots because obviously this is a bit of a movable feast. So I took a snapshot in 2014 of the global state of renewable energy laws then. And then my most recent snapshot I took on the 1st of August 2018. And by that point, 113 countries had a national renewable energy law. 
138 countries had support policies and 146 countries had specified renewable energy targets. And some of those targets were very, very low and some of those targets were set at 100%. So there is a huge amount of variance in this. Um, but what was interesting for me was that since the last time I took that snapshot, I'd seen 18 countries enact a renewable energy law for the first time with significant growth amongst the Caribbean countries and the African countries. But more frustratingly for me, over 50% of countries which I had found had had a law as at 1 January 2014, had amended their laws and amended their laws often quite significantly in that five year period. And those amendments were often prompted um, by changes in economic fortunes and by shifting views around the priorities of national governments. We also saw a spate of investor state disputes involving the sector, which as at 1 August 2018 was sitting at 102 different disputes. Um, as people would be aware, many of those occurred in Europe um, under the Energy Charter Treaty um, and involved significant amounts of arbitration. So that's kind of where we're sitting at at 1 August 2018. But what I really want to focus on throughout this presentation is what did that data tell us at a global snapshot level? And I want to begin by focusing on, well, why do countries have a national renewable energy law? And so the first thing that I suppose we need to talk about is, well, why don't countries have a national renewable energy law? So when I took this snapshot, 86 countries did not have a national renewable energy law. And I found that those countries tended to fit within three categories. The first one was that they were either highly energy self-sufficient and had a competing financial interest in fossil fuels. And for example, if we take the OPEC member states, in 2018, only Algeria, Ecuador and Venezuela had a law promoting renewable energy. But combined, the OPEC member states controlled 82% of the world's proven uh, crude oil supplies and they all have very high levels of energy self-sufficiency. So it became quite apparent that particularly those OPEC member states um, really view renewables, or did at that time, and it's starting to shift, as competition for their fossil fuel interests. The second category, which I tended to find more commonly in countries with a low GDP and poor access to electricity, was that some countries lack the skills, the capacity or the resources to develop legislation. And a lack of finances to provide subsidies or other kinds of regulatory support mechanisms was actually a key barrier for these countries. So these countries include countries such as Burundi, Niger, Mozambique, the Central African Republic, Somalia and Liberia. But what I did find in my research was that these countries often will have renewable energy policies and renewable energy targets, but they won't be legally binding or enforceable. So um, that presents a real challenge to these countries as to how to actually attract the investment and provide investors with sufficient certainty to ensure that um, they feel confident entering the market in these countries. And the third category is kind of unavoidable. Um, that is countries who have the constitutional inability to enact a national law. So that's countries such as Canada, where they um, choose to do their renewable energy legislation on a provincial level. So you'll see the Ontario set in tariff, you'll see separate laws in other parts of Canada, including Alberta. Um, but that would be the third main um, group of countries who don't have a national clear renewable energy law. So to then turn to the countries who did have a national renewable energy law, the way in which I sought to determine what their national motivations um, were 
I, I use their legislative objectives. So legislative objectives for the non-lawyers on the phone are often found in either the preamble or a legislative objective section, and they set out the purpose for the legislation. So they will explicitly state either a social, economic or political goal that the legislation is seeking to, be, uh, to achieve on the assumption that the legislation has been properly implemented and that it has the means um, to actually carry out that purpose. Now, the primary role for legislative objectives as lawyers is it provides us with a guide for statutory interpretation of ambiguous legislative provisions. And what I found is that the vast majority of countries in the world did actually have a legislative objective section that I could use for this purpose. Now, when I was reviewing the legislative objectives, I found that some of the existing literature, and I, I honestly don't think it is the fault of these um, scholars in any way, shape or form, it's just that nobody had ever been crazy enough to look at every country in the world's laws before, um, made some statements which were often extrapolated, I believe, from either um, the experience of EU member states where there is very great convergence and similarity in their laws as a result of being required to transpose the Renewable Energy Directive, or wealthy OECD countries, um, I found claims such as, sorry, such as these, that the motivations for and objectives of renewable energy policy are strikingly similar across most countries or that over the past couple of decades, environmental concerns have become more critical drivers of countries' decisions to increase renewables investment than energy security. Or you said this in Chanovich and Fisher, the foremost rationale is to reduce the threat of climate change. So that is what I was expecting to find when I actually studied these objectives. However, what I found was actually something quite different. And the thing that shocked me then and continues to shock me now is that this is the case even after the adoption of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So within the Paris Climate Change Agreement, we had 145 parties who included domestic action to support renewable energy to help mitigate and adapt to climate change in their nationally determined contributions and 109 parties actually provided quantifiable targets for renewables. Now, clearly, those quantifiable targets are obviously, um, that's a lower number of countries or fewer countries than have um, stated renewable energy targets. But I really expected to see that um, in the context of 50% of countries amending their laws, that this would be much more prominent as a national motivator. And what I found was that while there was some evidence of this being reflected in those 18 countries who had enacted new laws, when we had, oh sorry, 18 countries who had um, laws for the first time, when we had countries who were merely making a legislative amendment to an existing law and not going that next step and actually adopting a new law, um, we weren't really seeing this being reflected. So when I took the global snapshot, I'll talk to you a bit more about some of the other national motivations in a second. Only 28 countries around the world actually specified that one of their key drivers as a country for having a national renewable energy law was to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, 55 countries did state that they were in renewables for reasons of environmental protection. But the other thing that I found was that the countries who really were prioritising reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and ironically, Australia is actually one of those countries where our stated purpose for having um, a renewable energy law is to uh, address climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions which was obviously introduced under a former government and not the current one, um, was that those countries 
tended to be early adopters of uh, the Kyoto Protocol. So they tended to be countries who had been engaged in um, climate change and concerned about greenhouse gas emissions for a very long time. But even then, even then when you compared how they prioritise climate change compared to other competing priorities that they might have had, what I tended to find was that both addressing climate change and uh, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, environmental protection objectives were weighted very lowly. They were often um, one of the lowest priorities in their list of legislative objectives. So the, there were a number of other objectives identified. In fact, I found when I coded all the laws, um, 28 categories of different legislative objectives. And I then grouped those categories into eight key themes. So security, the environment, industrial policy, the economy, society, international and regional, sectoral and education and training. And what I did is I counted the references to the particular categories of legislative objectives and then I calculated what I've called their weighted ranks. So their weighted ranks um, for each priority that they had within their legislation. If it was the first priority, I assigned it a number one, the second priority got a number two and so on. And then I added up all of these rank order numbers and then divided those by the number of countries that cited that particular category of legislative objectives to see what the average weighting was um, internationally for that. And the thing that really shocked me was that I found that domestic consumer and producer needs are not converging internationally. So energy law and policy are not being driven primarily by international or even regional concerns. And the exception would obviously be in the European Union. But rather, renewable energy laws very clearly reflect domestic concerns and thus show national differences. And I think the reason for that is, is that in many countries, renewable energy laws um, have become a bit of a political hotbed, um, not least in Australia. And when you actually have a renewable energy law that reflects domestic concerns, that promotes greater acceptance at home, but it also fuels international competition. And just to show you what I mean by this, this is a sample of the countries whose name begins with G. And what it highlights um, are the very different motivations of countries having renewable energy laws. And I would suggest to you that this means that these laws, or at least the motivations for having these laws, are not strikingly similar. The other thing that I found is that on the whole, security objectives were much more highly prioritised than environmental objectives. And you can see that in total in that security category, the uh, average weighted rank was 3.56 uh, compared to 5.38 when we looked at environmental objectives. And the reason why I think that's interesting is that both energy security and environmental objectives are arguably um, an attempt to address an externality and the more closely aligned um, an objective actually was to a state of externality, um, the less likely it was to be cited, so particularly around the environmental one. But I thought I'd also give you just some other examples so you could see how different countries prioritise different things. And I'm not going to go through all of these. I thought I'd just give you a few snapshots that you might find interesting um, based on some of the people in the room. The first example would be energy security. What I found is that whilst most countries who have an objective um, targeting and prioritise energy security tend to have 
low levels of energy self-sufficiency that actually a number of significant energy exporters, including Colombia, Russia, Indonesia, Paraguay, and also to a lesser extent, Denmark, also have this as a key priority of theirs. And the reason for that is, and I'm going to give you the example of Denmark here, Denmark is 99% energy self-sufficient in 2017. It exported 6.5% of its crude oil production and 62.9% of its energy or its um, power generation came from renewable energy sources. And the thing that was striking about Denmark was that um, Denmark actually um, introduced changes in 2008, which would suggest that um, they were seeking to improve their terms of trade after the oil shocks in 2008. And what you find in the energy exporting countries is they're worried about not security of supply per se, but security of demand. And so that was a really interesting thing that I found throughout this research. In terms of diversifying supply, I think that's fairly obvious what those countries are trying to do, noting that both Finland and the Czech Republic both import in 100% of their gas and 88% and 66% of their oil respectively from Russia. Um, so they're seeking to increase their share of renewables within their market as a means of actually um, reducing the risk of um, supply cuts or um, oil shocks. Equally, Kazakhstan, Peru, Romania, Taiwan and South Africa all introduced um, their laws or amended their laws targeting uh, diversifying supply either during or in the aftermath of the 2008 oil shock. So it's quite interesting actually being able to monitor when countries are actually amending their laws or enacting laws and you can actually see clear correlations between key market events and then how that's being reflected at a national level. In terms of some other ones that I have on that list, um, I think it's fairly self-evident why the EU member states, the four EU candidate countries and Kosovo as a potential candidate country may have um, prioritised um, the creation of an internal energy market and regional integration. I mean, that merely reflects the EU 2030 and 2050 energy strategy, uh, the energy union, European energy security strategy, and clean energy for all Europeans. So one of the things that I did find was that both Morocco and Paraguay also had this objective. And Morocco has it as it seeks to strengthen regional integration through the opening of energy to Euro-Mediterranean markets and the harmonisation of energy laws and regulations. So what Morocco is actually trying to do through their laws is they're trying to help their renewable energy generators get access into that key European market because they see this as a future source of wealth, which I thought was interesting. Paraguay, on the other hand, is also a net energy exporter and they predominantly export hydropower from two hydropower uh, facilities. One is a Taipu, which is um, operated with Brazil, and Yacrita, which is operated with Argentina. So again, they're concerned about regional integration because it is a source of market for them. I won't cover reduced risk of uh, natural and nuclear disasters, but if people are interested, I can discuss that more in questions. Um, but some other key objectives that I found, again, no great surprise here, the industrial powerhouses and emerging economies, particularly in Asia, um, were very concerned with supporting the development of new industry and infrastructure. And these countries actually have a significantly lower gross domestic product of 9,995 US dollars compared with all of those countries who have a national renewable energy law of $16,024. So again, this is being targeted as a key source of future development, future growth, future wealth. Turkey, I will again skip, except to say that they then couple theirs with a local content clause, um, which requires at least 50% of large-scale solar and wind to um, 
have their equipment domestically manufactured in Turkey. The Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, prioritises public health, improving living standards and social development. But the last one that I really want to focus on before I move on is about access to energy and energy affordability. And what my research found was that if you are a country with a low GDP, say on average 7,012 US dollars, you tend to prioritise access to energy. If you are a wealthy country, you are then in the position to worry about energy affordability. And in fact, out of all of those 28 legislative objectives I found that on average, um, energy affordability had the highest um, average GDP of 20,373 US dollars. And what that means is that the countries who are prioritising energy affordability are much more likely to focus on least cost renewable energy generation and only the most cost competitive projects, regardless of their size or location. So you then see um, these motivations being filtered through into project selection and also um, seeking to find regulatory support mechanisms that will deliver those objectives at least cost. Before we move on, it's probably worth just mentioning that one of the other areas where there is divergence internationally, though less than with the national motivations, is around what even is renewable energy. And so while I found that the vast majority of countries support PV solar, wind, concentrated solar thermal, um, small scale hydropower, landfill gas, sewage treatment gas, biogas, biomass and geothermal, what you start to see from hydropower um, downwards is a significant drop off in those countries who accept that as a renewable energy source for the purposes of their law. So to turn to hydropower, for example, large scale hydropower is excluded by 27 countries from their law. So the definition of what small scale actually is varies considerably from three megawatts in Panama up to 30 megawatts in Malaysia and Tajikistan. So it's, it's one of the points I'd like to make um, is that you need to be very careful in comparing statistics around different renewable energy sources in different countries because what is defined as renewable energy and even the scale of it differs really quite considerably by country. Another interesting recent development in terms of hydropower is that we're starting to see pumped hydropower being explicitly excluded from definitions. And we've already seen that happen in countries like Albania, Taiwan, and also in the most recent uh, recast renewable energy directive from the EU. Another area that I think you need to watch when looking at definitions is the definition of biomass. Now, quite clearly, the vast majority of countries are very happy to accept modern biomass as a renewable energy source. But one of the other things that I found is that some countries are including um, some sources of energy within their definition that are either traditional or woody biomass, which many other countries may not consider to be um, renewable energy sources. So, for example, Kenya actually has in their Energy Act that renewable energy sources includes charcoal. Now charcoal within the Kenyan market makes up 82% of household energy in urban areas. It employs 900,000 people in Kenya and it contributes 1.6 billion US dollars to the Kenyan economy. But at the same time, Kenya's really battled with this because whilst their Energy Act is promoting charcoal as a renewable energy source, Kenya has less than 2% of forest cover left and in 2018, this actually led to a ban in a number of counties and restrictions on both its transportation and trading. So it has provided a real challenge and it's an area where the United Nations Development Program has been working very hard with Kenya to try and develop sustainable forms of charcoal, uh, which are actually renewable within the, um, or regenerate at a faster rate than obviously charcoal does. Equally, Bangladesh, Belarus, 
and Finland and Thailand, those countries who often have quite significant logging industries include wood. And in Australia, we even include wood from old growth native forests which has been very controversial because it actually can change the economics significantly um, in terms of the viability of logging projects. And again, query whether you're going to regrow an old growth native forest at a fast or equal rate um, to the rate of use. A number of countries actually explicitly exclude both um, traditional and woody biomass. I've provided you with an example there from China's renewable energy law. And I note that traditional biomass is not recognised by either IRENA, the EU, or any other developed country. Another interesting quirk that I found, and this is for our Swedish friends who are on the line, is that in Sweden, their law on electricity certificates, if you look at the definition of renewable energy source, you'll find that actually it looks fairly straightforward. It's something we can feel fairly comfortable with. But then I found that there was a definition of renewable electricity which stated that renewable electricity was electricity produced from renewable energy sources or peat. And obviously peat is the initial stage of qualification. And the greenhouse gas emissions from burning peat are similar to um, those of fossil fuels on a life cycle analysis. But um, Sweden and Finland are obviously both major sources of peat, particularly within Europe. And so again, it's a way of trying to support domestic production. Keeping in mind though, that this is a snapshot taken at 1 August 2018, and the law may have subsequently moved on. Another thing that I briefly wanted to mention is what happens when domestic needs are not accounted for. And I thought an interesting case study here might be the case of Malawi. Um, Malawi is actually a landlocked country in Africa, it's um, in the red there. And Malawi does not have any electricity interconnectors with any other country um, that would take it to the ocean. Yet Malawi in their Energy Act, Energy Regulation Act, actually include ocean thermal, ocean wave and ocean tidal energy within their law. Now, there are 11 countries around the world um, who are landlocked who support ocean energy. But what I found was that those countries tended to be EU member states, for example, countries like Austria and Hungary, or EU candidate countries um, who were required to transpose that EU renewable energy directive. Malawi is kind of the standout as the one country who's obviously had, um, I suspect, an aid project, which is probably inappropriately um, transpose a definition and it doesn't quite work within the context. So if there's anyone who's doing any work with Malawi, you might want to suggest they might consider changing it. Another area where you can see quite clearly um, local um, end user needs and producer needs being reflected is in re regulatory support mechanisms. I'm just quite conscious of time, so um, I'll just give you a bit of a light touch and again if you're interested we can discuss this in more detail later. And I thought I'd give you some specific examples from China. So those of you who have been in the sector for a long time would know that um, China has used local content clauses within their regulations very very effectively both within the wind sector and in the solar sector um, prompting um, disputes with US steelmakers before the World Trade Organization, um, with US steelmakers claiming that the Chinese government had acted in breach of the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. To give you an example, in 2005, the market share of foreign turbine firms in China was 75%. So the um, National Development and Reform Commission of China introduced a cap which required Chinese wind farms to source at least 70% of turbine parts from domestic producers. And over a three year period, this was so successful that China went from only having six domestic wind turbine manufacturers to being the number one producer of wind turbines in the world. And then indeed, when the GFC struck, and I actually moved to China because the Chinese had money, one of the things that was very striking was that 
um, the Chinese banks who actually had money to still fund renewable energy projects in other parts of the world were insisting that actually Chinese wind turbines were being used in order to get those wind turbines up to bankability on an international stage. Other things that we see within the Chinese market include um, differential feed-in tariffs depending on resource quality. So if you're based in a region with a poor solar resource, you'll actually be given a higher level of feed-in tariff to reflect the fact that your loan costs are likely to be higher. Differential quotas to different provinces and states. And even in some provinces, they will coincide payment terms um, with harvest and lambing season to ensure that the money is available for end consumers to be able to repay loans. So where do I think this is all going? The first thing that I would note is that as renewable energy sources become increasingly cost competitive, I think we're starting to see a shift from accelerating deployment to actually managing high levels of green integration. And this will lead to some really interesting questions in capacity constrained regions. And we're already having this issue in Australia of, well, do you prevent new deployment of, say, for example, PV solar cells altogether? Do you say you can put a new PV solar cell on your rooftop, but you cannot export? Or do you constrain every um, PV solar system as a whole um, and limit their export capacity. All of these are going to be really difficult questions um, for the sector and questions for the regulator. And there isn't a clearly obvious solution that is going to keep everyone politically happy. The second thing that we're seeing in Australia in particular is that we need our renewable energy sources and technology to be much more resilient to new threats. So for example, in bushfire prone areas in Australia, one of the problems that we saw most recently was that actually the bushfires took out um, large swathes of our electricity transmission network and distribution network, which then meant that people couldn't access emergency broadcast information and they couldn't get access to, um, for example, power to pump hoses to help fight those fires unless they had generators available. So what we're starting to see is a rollout of distributed energy resources and microgrids. And the other thing that I've noticed in Australia recently is that, for example, last year, there was a significant drop in the production of hydropower as we had one of the worst droughts in living memory. So we're going to require these renewable energy sources to be much more resilient and adaptable to climate change. So just briefly in conclusion, the primary motivation of most countries in adopting renewable energy laws is not addressing climate change. Rather, those national priorities are clearly evident as motivations and market drivers. And this is the source of key competition within our market. And you see that all over, particularly the Asian region, where um, countries are actively competing. South Korea, China and Japan, and also to a lesser extent, the United States, are actively competing for investment um, to try and become key technology manufacturers. Um, I would note that this has also posed a significant risk to the sector. And one of the things that I'm anticipating will happen with the current coronavirus outbreak is that the supply chain, particularly for PV solar cells, is going to be substantially disrupted, at least in the short to medium term. And perhaps for the first time in the last 10 plus years, we are likely to see uh, prices go up um, until that supply has been re-established. So to leave you with some parting thoughts, um, energy storage laws, um, and I'm doing another very similar project with energy storage laws at the moment, they're currently about 10 years behind renewable energy laws, but there are key lessons that we can learn about what works and what doesn't work in particular economies, particular political context um, that I think need to be reflected when we're looking at laws for emerging energy technology. So on that very cheerful note, there's the book that I've just written all about this um, and happy to hand back to you, Hans.